This is uh, part two of a um, series on applying glycemic index or calculating glycemic index, glycemic load, to dietary recall. <clears throat> that sounds kind of technical, doesn't it? Well, it's all based on this. I mean, it's the, the fact that we're basing what we do on a daily basis by news blurbs like um, low-carb diet extends your lifestyle, low-carb diet um, investigator suggests that the uh, dietary guidelines are changed and then we get washed backwards into oh no low-carb diet was found to um, shorten lifespan so we're all trying to bottom line it trying to keep it simple and trying to figure out what to do in um, in our life but <clears throat> I've come up with a with a new theme. It's just not that simple. <clears throat> so, uh, the previous uh, uh, video basically talked about this study. I I, I will put it again under this uh, video as well. And basically, what we're doing is we're talking about how to figure out what's the glycemic uh, load from dietary recall. Now, <clears throat> it's not that simple. First of all, you have to do the dietary survey. Uh, FFQ, uh, Food Frequency Questionnaire, uh, or the 24-hour. There are others as well. Um, <clears throat> so first the survey has to be done. Then the foods have to be matched to foods um, that are in a standard database. Uh, there, you can do that actually with a piece of software. It's Windows-based Windows software. It's called the National Data um, System for uh, Research. Uh, the Nutritional. I'm sorry, Nutritional Data System. I was trying to figure out uh, Nutritional Data System um, for Research. So that takes, pardon the digression, but that takes the memory of the individual who ate the food into um, a list of foods for which we know the glycemic index. By the way, uh, glycemic index is the glucose in the blood glycemic impact from these foods. <clears throat> well, once you've gotten a list of the glycemic index indices of these foods and the foods, then you still don't have the glycemic load of the day because you don't know how much the patient or the, the individual uh, participant ate and how that, was, um, how that was mixed with other foods. You do that with a couple of other standard databases. One is the international uh, database or standard for um, glycemic and uh, index and load. The other is the University of Sydney um, in, uh, database on glycemic loads. And both of these databases have been calculated with lots of um, clarity regarding um, the glycemic load and translating uh, index from index to load. Now, <clears throat> I'm just doing all of that as a little bit of a, of a prep because most of this discussion some of it is about how to do it but the bigger part of the discussion is the findings from this study um, the numbers are a little bit scary especially for somebody like me who's been a physician caring for middle-aged overweight um, Euro, uh, European Americans African Americans uh, with insulin resistance. We eat too much food and the food that we eat is way too high, uh, high glycemic index. And you'll see that in a few minutes. <clears throat> okay, so we talked a little bit about how you convert all these. Just a couple of other, um, again this is the study, and a couple of other points, interesting points about uh, the study itself. Here's a, there was an example in here 
in a simple example that highlights only types of sugars. They're talking about Fanta versus Pepsi versus Coke. Now, in my mind, they're all bad. They're all the same thing. They're all high fructose. But eh, they got a lot more detail than this. And again, that's the point of bringing up this example. Um, here's the thing. In a similar example that highlights only types of sugars, consider Pepsi with 27 grams of total carbohydrates. Um, yada, yada, yada. Uh, fructose, glucose, sucrose, and maltose. Pepsi is the best matched to beverages in the international table and then to Coca-Cola, which has 27 grams of the same percentages of carbohydrates. And they went into fructose, glucose, you know, um, the percentages of those. And then it said, this is a much better match than a similar beverage, Fanta, which has 32 grams of total carbohydrate with 18% fructose, 17% glucose, 62% sucrose, and an 8% 8, 8 maltose for a GI value, uh, an index of 68, whereas the index for Coca-Cola and Pepsi is 63. So again, I would have been more than happy to lump Coke, Pepsi, and Fanta all together. They weren't. They were much more specific than that. So that gives you a little bit of perspective on how they handled uh, mixed dishes. <coughs> and... Um, Again, they calculated, they got weighted averages of the foods and applied the glycemic indices of the weighted averages into the foods. Now, how you prepare food also can impact it. Uh, I don't see anything on how they did that. I, I, I doubt, I think they just had to make, make assumptions on preparation. They also go in to say there were 13 commercial sugar cookies that we had to lump into one group. Um, and they gave... Uh, a paragraph for, worth, worth of justification regarding how, how and why they did that. Again, very, very detailed. Uh, two nutritionists did this information uh, blinded to their own and each other's information, repeated tons of them, got a very high um, correlation. Now, uh, in terms of finding matches, a value of four was assigned if the food had a direct match in the international table, a three if the food was closely related, and two if the food was not, oh, didn't have a close match. Of the 1,261 foods in this survey, 91% achieved a level of three or higher. So again, it's, um, it's a pretty good survey, and the, the data was fairly clear. Now let's get to the results. 9,067 24-hour days of food recall. Uh, the mean was 1,966 calories with about a 600 calorie standard deviation. So about 2,000 calories, give or take 500, 600. The percent of carbohydrates was 51% with um, a variation of five of 7.5. Now see, I thought that was very, very interesting. You remember one of the things that got me started on this series was all the questions I started getting from viewers and all of the reaction we got to the carbohydrate um, studies in, the, in um, the Lancet. <clears throat> and they showed the U-curve. I actually still haven't done a uh, a video on the U-curve, and it's not here. It's, uh, it's going to be too hard for me to find it for you. The U-curve is not that um, different among these populations. The U-curve shows basically the risk associated with the percentage of um, calories by carbohydrates, and the sweet spot's around 50%. So <clears throat> I think that was very interesting. Even in this population, uh, which had a huge glycemic load coming on board, it was 50% of their calories from uh, carbohydrates. So, but again, as it gets back to it, a carbohydrate is not a carbohydrate is not a carbohydrate. Um, broccoli is not uh, the same as 
um, bread. White, white bread's not the same as um, whole wheat bread. So the glycemic index was 60 for uh, on average for these for the foods that these people ate. Um, 23% uh, simple carbohydrates, uh, simple calculations didn't have to be estimated at all. 78% of them had to be estimated using the technique that I, I talked about with getting the portions of the foods, the glycemic index of all the components of the food, multiplying that out. Now, <clears throat> here is the, inf let's look at this again. Here's the glycemic index of the typical foods on average that these people are eating. Can you see that? 85. Bread, white bread is what? It's uh, uh, less than that. So these typical, typical diets are including tons of uh, high glycemic foods here. Very few got below 70. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about this population. Let's, actually, let's go to the next thing. A list of the typical, the top foods that they were eating. All-purpose flour, white sugar, cola beverages, white bread, white rice, boiled potatoes. These weren't the top foods. These were, these were the top carbohydrates. And I don't see broccoli or cauliflower or green beans, or uh, even some of the, I, I don't see any ancient grains here either. I mean, all I see is just high glycemic index foods. No wonder we've got a problem. And let me just reiterate, I've been through a long series and have uh, picked apart these studies about as well as uh, most people I'm seeing, and I'm still staying on my low-carb diet, <clears throat> and you can see why. The, what we're recommending, what you're seeing in terms of, quote, keto diet, is uh, recommendations to, um, to replace these foods with better ones. Cornstarch, one, one of the worst. Dates, also very, very bad. Uh, in terms of glycemic index. Pancake mix, syrup, table syrup, corn syrup, uh, cream of rice, dehydrated potatoes, cereals. I had a 75-year-old patient who uh, was sure that he didn't have a glucose uh, problem. Ate two large bowls of uh, cereal every morning and uh, couldn't understand why his blood sugar actually turned out to be so bad. It, at one point, it was over 200 in the uh, glucose tolerance test. Got him off of these, got him focused on keto, low carb, whatever you want to call it, basically substituting these high glycemic index foods for lower glycemic index foods. He lost 30 pounds. He, uh, he got much healthier, much, much quicker uh, than he would have trying to, <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm just not even going to finish that sentence. Again, this makes the point that I was making. You're wanting to, subs when you hear low carb or keto diet, basically what people are talking about is substituting all of these high glycemic index foods for lower glycemic index foods. Let me see, is there anything else? Oh, yes, I will say this. Uh, in the summary, they did go on to say that, uh, compare the 24-hour um, dietary recall to the FFQ, Food Frequency Questionnaire. There are differences. There are other uh, studies, surveys, which have uh, applied these techniques to the FFQ. The FFQ is what was used in the ERIC survey. So, and actually it appears to be easier to apply it to the FFQ than the 24-hour uh, uh, recall. So, I'm sorry, but it's still just not that simple.